Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar on 3D natives. Um, so as you know, today we will focus on 3D printing with ABS composite materials for industrial applications. So I'm Carlosa and I'm here with uh, two experts in additive manufacturing, Ryan from Chemia and Johan from MakerBot. So before I introduce uh, our speakers uh, and as we wait for everyone to join us, I'm gonna pull up a few questions on the screen uh, that you should be able to see right now. Uh, and the idea is just to learn a bit more about who is watching today. Um, and if you have any experience in 3D printing, uh, if you know much about composite materials. So it's really um, just for our speakers also to know who they're addressing uh, when they will present in more detail the subject at hand today. So I can see that people are voting. Um, let us know also in the chat if you can hear us well, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. But it looks like everything is working. Okay. So I'm just going to leave these up on the screen for one more minute. Uh, you have four questions. It should really take a few seconds to answer. Um, yeah, I'll just keep them for another minute before we get started. We're at fifty five per cent, so just waiting for a few people that are joining us right now to also send in their answers, um, and then we'll jump right into today's agenda. Okay, so let's uh, share the results. Uh, it looks like actually most people do have some experience with 3D printing and have used it in their professional activities, 45%. Uh, it's actually composites, it's 30% 30, 30 so not much of a difference there and for final parts most of you have not used 3D printing for final parts and finally most of you have not used uh, 3D printing in the production chain of your company. Okay, so let's jump right into today's agenda. So we're gonna start with a very brief introduction of ABS, just for some context. Uh, and then we're gonna jump straight into the different types of ABS composite materials and their applications with Chemia and MakerBot. Uh, and then we'll also be looking at a ca case study uh, of one of Chemia's ABS composite filaments uh, used on the Method X 3D printer from MakerBot. So as always, then we keep 10, 15 minutes uh, to answer your questions. So don't hesitate uh, to send them on the chat section throughout this uh, webinar. So let's start with our speakers. So today I am joined with Ryan, uh, who is the Vice President of Operations overseeing Chemia's activity in North and South America. Uh, after nearly 10 years in new product development in the aerospace and defense industries, working on projects such as electronic paper and military electro-optical sensor solutions, Ryan came to Armour, which is actually the group behind the Chemia brand, uh, to lead the US operations. And in 2019, Ryan helped Armour launch Chemia additive materials to the North American market. Um, and I'm also joined with, by Johan, who is the Vice uh, President of Product Development. He oversees uh, global product strategy, development, and go-to market initiatives 
for MakerBot's 3D printing solutions. And Johan was uh, instrumental in the launch of the company's core products, including the MakerBot Replicator Plus, the Method, and Method X 3D printers. And myself, I'm Colossa. I'm the editor in chief of uh, the of 3D Natives English website. So if you didn't know, 3D Natives is an online media platform about 3D printing. So we cover the daily news uh, of the sector, but we also offer decision-making tools uh, for 3D printing, such as a business directory, a job board, uh, a price compare engine for printers. And uh, we also do these webinars, these monthly webinars to talk about the latest AM developments. Um, so I'm going to give you a very uh, brief introduction to what we will be discussing. So if you didn't know, ABS is one of the most popular thermoplastics in the 3D printing market, and it's uh, most commonly used in filament form on FDM, FFF machines. Uh, and it was actually one of the first materials to be used in industrial applications uh, because of its interesting properties such as impact resistance and toughness. Um, and these are properties that uh, our speakers will be discussing in more detail just later. Um, and. Uh, within this context we're looking at composites and not just uh, ABS so it's true that if you are interested in additive manufacturing and it looks like uh, most of you did have some experience already you will have noticed that manufacturers are increasingly looking for materials that can unlock new manufacturing possibilities and that's um, the case with composites because uh, they take basically a matrix materials and then add fibers um, that give new and interesting properties for industrial applications. For example, with carbon fiber, you're gonna have a more resistant part, but that is also lightweight. So we'll be discussing all of this um, just shortly. And uh, to give you an idea on the market of uh, composite uh, 3D printing. It's uh, a market that is uh, growing and uh, the latest study from ID Tech X revealed that the global market for composite 3D printing would reach a value of $1.7 billion uh, by the year 2030. So I'm going to hand it over to Johan to present MakerBot and um, then uh, Ryan will be talking about Chemia and we will jump right into today's subject. Johan, I think you're I on was, mute. I was muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, my name is Johan Bro. I'm the VP of Product Development at MakerBot. Uh, I hope everyone on this call is somewhat familiar with MakerBot, but I'll give a quick overview. Uh, we really pioneered desktop 3D printing in 2009, so we were one of the first companies uh, in desktop 3D printing and we really put desktop 3D printing on the map. Uh, so we've been around for a while. We are headquartered in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, that's also where we were founded. And we are a subsidiary of Stratasys, uh, which is the leader in uh, 3D printing. Uh, we are part of Stratasys, but we work pretty independently. Um, and we serve two different markets. So we have the professional market and the education market, obviously. For this webinar today, we're going to focus on the professional applications, uh, but we also have a pretty large user base in education, both in the K-12 uh, world, but also in higher education. Uh, something else that's interesting to know about us is that we own Thingiverse, which is the largest uh, 3D printing uh, library in the world. So anybody who is into 3D printing, this is a great resource to go to and uh, upload files or just browse files uh, that you can print and uh, download very easily. Uh, quickly, just wanted to give, also give an overview of the uh, evolution of our 3D printers uh, that you can see here on the slide. So the very first printer was the uh, Cupcake CNC uh, that was launched in 2009. Uh, this was a kit, so you had to put it uh, together yourself. Uh, and that was really the very first product that we put out, it had a pretty small build volume. And then from, from there, the, the product uh, evolved. So the uh, replicator was really the first assembled product uh, that you can see here, which launched in 2012. The replicator two uh, was really the, the product that I think that 
got the most attention. You saw that on a couple of different magazine covers. It really was the point when Makerbot, uh, you know, blew up and, and really became very popular. Uh, and then after that, we had the Replicator 5th Gen in 2014. Uh, that, that product really took these printers to the next level in terms of usability. So you had Wi-Fi connectivity, a camera. It was a very, very seamless uh, workflow and uh, really a big step uh, for 3D printing. And then in 2019, just recently, we launched Method. And that's really the printer that we're going to talk about the most today. Uh, this is our first professional printer that really bridges the gap between desktop and industrial 3D printing. I'm not going to go too deep because I have uh, a couple of slides later that we're going to talk about. Last year, I wanted to mention we have a lot of different customers in the professional space spanning many different industries from industrial companies like ABB to more consumer product focused companies like OXO or Peloton, uh, robotics companies like KUKA and, uh, you know, all access robotics. So really a, a pretty wide range. Later on, I'm going to talk about all access robotics a little bit more because that's a company that we are going to uh, discuss in the context of the case study uh, for the ABS carbon material. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan to introduce Kimia. There we go. Oops, went, went slide too many. So uh, yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to introduce you to Kimia. As uh, Carlotta mentioned before, Kimia is a brand of the Armor Group. And so I wanted to first take a step back to kind of tell you a little bit about Armor and how Kimia fits and how we can provide solutions for the additive manufacturing and uh, materials portion. So Armor, we are a uh, mid-sized industrial company concentrating in materials and chemical development. And so you'll see here our five main brands and business units in Armor. The first one being uh, Armor Industrial Coating and Printing. Here's we're making inks for 2D printers. And you'll see that that's a common theme. We're working with printing companies like, like MakerBot here. So with um, Industrial Coating and Printing, we're making an ink for thermal transfer, which is used in labeling and lot, um, lot marking and uh, like pharmaceutical food packaging. And then we also have Armor Office Printing, which is again reusing inks and cartridges, and it's a, a remanufacturing standpoint. But again, it's the chemistry behind that that we're concentrating on. And then um, with that, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, we decided to advance into the new technology areas, and we concentrated on three areas. Uh, first and foremost is we, for this webinar is Armor 3D. And this is where we're taking our chemistry know-how and our manufacturing industrial know-how to make a filaments for 3D. The other ones you can see here is we do have a line of organic photovoltaic films and uh, battery foils. You see their armor advanced coating or foils that go into lithium ion batteries. But all of that ties together through is the chemistry and the know-how we have to bring that to market and solve industrial problems. So if we go to the, the next slide, similar to what Johan was saying, we are working with uh, other large companies across a, a spectrum of ranges. And so you can see here we have uh, aerospace with Air, Airbus to transportation with Alstom and uh, everybody through the middle. And the key here is to see that we have the industrial partners. That's how to take these additive materials and take them from just the prototype one off stage into end use production. And that's what we want to highlight today. So. We're going to go through and talk about with end use production kind of the ABS applications. So, Johan, if you want to speak to the FDM technology. Yeah, so really quickly, uh, I wanted to just uh, remind everybody uh, on what FDM technology is. It's obviously quite different from many of the other technologies out there, like SLA or powder bed fusion. So, you, the idea here is uh, with FDM that you have basically have a, an extruder which is uh, sort of like a hot glue gun uh, that a filament is being fed into. The extruder melts the filament and uh, puts it down onto a build plate and then layer by layer, the object is being built. So uh, pretty simple uh, concept, but uh, it has come a very, very long way in terms of materials that are available for FDM and also uh, in terms of print quality. So 
The benefits of F FDM, wanted to highlight those really quick. Uh, first of all, you can print pretty complex geometries. I'm going to talk about the different options for support material later on, but uh, you know, essentially you have the option for breakaway support and for soluble support, and soluble supports especially allow you to print very complex parts. I think the biggest benefit to me for FDM is the amount of functional materials that are available. Uh, Ryan is going to go through some of the ABS composites, but I, I think the amount of materials uh, that you can print with FDM technology really is unmatched. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can do with your printer. Uh, it's pretty safe, uh, this technology, compared to others. You, there, there are not a lot of chemicals involved or additional equipment that you need for po post-processing. Uh, and that's why also it's very easy to use. Uh, and lastly, it's pretty low cost compared to a lot of different technologies. And with that, I'll hand it back to Ryan. So yeah, so if we talk about um, ABS materials and how they fit into the, the hierarchy of uh, thermoplastics and injection molded uh, 3D printing materials, you can kind of see the pyramid. And if you've seen this before, but on the bottom, you have your commodity plastics, and on the top, you have your, your high-performance plastics. And the key here that to, what to take from this is you got your commodity plastics, and as Carlotta mentioned before, ABS is one of the most common used plastics in the market, and we see that in everyday life. And, you know, it's, it's on our computer, it's within our cell phone. Everything that you see around you is, is utilizing this. But then the key is for us is how can we take that ABS and then improve it with the composites. And that gives you the full range and allows you to extend the applications. So with that, you can see we have on the right some of the chemical materials that we offer, and ABS standard is in the, in the lower portion. If you go up into the technical range, that's where we get into the ABS carbon, Kevlar, ESD, and we'll also talk about ABS electrically conductive. And so the key here is when you put in those composites materials, we can change the properties, and that allows you to optimize your performance. And as uh, Johan was mentioning, with the attributes of 3D printing, as you can change these uh, attributes of each of the material, you can optimize your part build. And so when you're optimizing your part build, you get increased performance of your end use product. So if we go to the, in the next slide and we kind of talk about some of the uh, pros and cons of ABS just in general, and what we can do to help resolve that with the, the formulation of the filaments and the printer itself. So with ABS, the pros and why you see it in uh, many, many different products in daily life is, you know, it's excellent in impact resistance, the good appearance and the toughness and a, a nice operating temperature. It's not crazy high or crazy low, but it's really good for everyday life. And it's uh, relatively resistant to, you know, the daily use that you're going to see in acids and bases. So when you add all this together, it gets to be very cost effective and easily adaptable. And that's why we want to concentrate around working with ABS. Now, that said, there are some cons with it. And the cons mainly are within the, the printing application. But what the great part is, is that printing application cons can be resolved with our materials and with the proper uh, printer. So you see that some of the cons that you see, if you're familiar with uh, 3D printing, is that you get a lot of shrinkage or warpage. So you get some layer adhesion problems or you get part uh, dimensional stability that you want to keep. So if you want a high accuracy, that has been some of the challenges in the past. If I go into kind of talking about each one of these materials, we'll kind of talk about how that this can, how these uh, additives in the composites will resolve that and help you. So when we talk first, um, we're going to talk, like I said, about ABS uh, Kevlar, carbon, ESD, and electric conductive. Uh, we're going to save uh, carbon fiber for the last because that'll go into that case study we mentioned. But uh, so first, I'm going to start with ABS Kevlar. Kevlar, as you, everybody knows, you automatically think of the uh, Kevlar jackets. But the key here is that it's a it's a fiber that's incorporated into the ABS. And Kevlar is a fiber that has a very high strength to weight ratio. And so when you do that, you're going to allow you to do more light weighting in your design. So you can take out material, still keep the strength, still keep the robustness. And this allows you to have a, a good finished part by lightweighting and improving the operation of it. 
The other thing that I mentioned before of one of the cons of ABS is that it can be hard to print in some situations. Well, with ABS Kevlar, the printing behavior is improved. And when you have the improved printing behavior, you're going to reduce your shrinkage and your warping. And this allows you to get precise printed parts. And this is very, very important when you're dealing with anything that you have to fit together and that you can build both halves of, of a part or multiple halves and put it together and have a good uh, assembly standpoint. And again, we're dealing with talking applications where you can go with end use parts. The other thing with uh, when you put the Kevlar into the, into the ABS composite is that you're going to get better surface aspects. And finally with the printing is it's not as abrasive as the ABS carbon. So in my mind, you have ABS carbon, which is your, your strongest, and then you got Kevlar, which is very close, but it gives you some of the improvements on the printability and uh, uh, end product. So when we talk about, good, I, uh, it did advance uh, some of the general applications. So you see it in, in daily life, you know, it's in your tires that you have on your vehicle. It's in a lot of um, aerospace applications, robotics, um, and then, like I said, everybody's familiar with the Kevlar jacket, you know, like the bulletproof jacket. Again, the, the whole key there is that why everybody thinks about that is Kevlar is really good for its strength to weight ratio. So it's a very lightweight and it has a lot of strength with it. So I think I saw that uh, a Kevlar strand is five times stronger than steel when you talk about strength to weight ratio. And so that allows us to do a lot of different things. And that's where we can apply this into 3D printing as well is you can start adding a little bit more strength, a, lot of, a little bit more in the Young's modulus to give it that improvement processes. So if we go into the next uh, material that we wanted to highlight is ABS ESD. So again, as we mentioned, a lot of it, ABS is used in uh, electrical consumer goods. And so if you are using this and you wanna do anything uh, from the standpoint of tooling or uh, housings, you know, a lot of times you want that to be uh, ESD. And so this allows that uh, electrostatic to discharge and so you can protect your electronics. So within Kimio, we have uh, two lines of ABS ESD. Uh, so we have one that's uh, um, natural, which we have in white and then also in the, in the black. And so this allows some different things to for us to work in end use products. But uh, if we kind of talk, this kind of showing the applications, you can see that you, know, you can make your different types of tool holders. This is just showing a screwdriver holder, but if you're in an assembly process and you're on the assembly line, a lot of times ESD is very important in uh, electronics uh, assembly. So you can make specialized tooling, uh, you can make jigs for holding, uh, in this case, you can see a printed circuit boards going through an assembly line, you can make your jigs and fixtures this way, all the way to the end use product of uh, protecting it. If we go into like the next step from ESD, the next one would be electrically conductive. And so it might be a question of, well, if I have ESD, why do I need electrically conductive? And what, you're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take from a, a common plastic, your ABS standard, which is an insulator, we're trying to go to the end, other end of the spectrum. And so as, as you make this more conductive, that allows you to do some different things, especially in the electronics standpoint. Um, you know, it's, it's still, if you talk about something that's uh, usually very conductive as a metal, but you can use plastics in this state case. So you can go, you can work with light weighting, but still get that conductive standpoint. It also allows you to work with grounding in different applications and then uh, electrical shielding. So if you have a situation where you need have a lot of inter interference, you can make cable guides or uh, different types of shields within electrical uh, assemblies to protect that interference. And then um, one other thing that uh, I, I can see being a, a, a positive is that with it being conductive, you can do electrostatic painting. So if you talk about end use and finishes, you get this nice finish, but then you can also do with standard electrostatic painting processes. And that allows you to incorporate it into like say bumper design and automotive. So you can get into some really custom things and it allows you to, to work in this application. 
So if we come into the last part I was kind of mentioning before, uh, very similar to ABS uh, Kevlar, is we have ABS Carbon, which is going to give you a little bit more on the, the tensile strength, and uh, but it still allows you to do that light weighting that we talked about, so you can take out materials. So with our ABS Carbon, you know we have uh, chopped carbon fibers that we incorporate into the material. This improves the strength that we talked about, and it also improves the printability like we talked about with Kevlar. Um, you know, so typically, sometimes in ABS, you'll find that you get delamination between layers and um, you get warping. With the Kevlar, this allows, and I'm sorry, the carbon, you can get that improved printing, printability. So um, the one thing that's kind of different is what we talked about with uh, ABS Kevlar and ABS carbon is that the carbon is going to be a little bit more um, aggressive in the extruder. So where the Kevlar is a little bit uh, easier, but you get improved uh, performance, especially in that strength standpoint. And so that's where it's all about knowing what your application is, but when you have those different applications, you can pick and choose what's the right solution. And again, I tie that back to, this is where we can provide solutions and optimize the performance for the end user in the, the end use part or the fixturing or even the prototyping. But uh, carbon fiber applications, you, you see them around without even realizing it. There, there are many different places, but uh, you can do a lot. We have some pictures here, but you see it with um, air ducts. You'll build that in there. We'll talk a little bit about tooling and manufacturing processes. That's a very common. And then marine and aircraft applications. Uh, you'll see carbon fiber applications all the time. So we wanted to go into a a detail application where we're talking about the tooling and manufacturing and using the carbon fiber. So if we go to the next one, it's a case study that we worked on with, uh, with MakerBots and they used our ABS carbon on the Method X. So uh, Johan, if you wanna explain that. Sure, so, yeah, this is a pretty exciting uh, case study that we have worked on with uh, one of our uh, beta Customers, uh, they're called All Access Robotics. Uh, it's a sm machine shop in Dallas, Texas, that uh, also works on a machine shop and uh, manufacturing automation. So essentially, they started out just as a high precision machine shop, but then uh, automated everything in the machine shop to be more competitive with uh, specifically overseas manufacturing uh, because they noticed that if they uh, automate certain processes. They can run their machines overnight. They can run it when usually there's nobody in the shop and that really brings down the cost for them. Uh, but they, they got so good at automating all of their machine shop that they now offered these services to other companies. And that's, uh, they're basically a second company that they founded all access robotics, uh, that allows them to offer these services to other companies. And so, uh, you know, while they use their 3D printers for many different applications, I think tooling and specifically end of arm tooling is one where they saw a huge benefit of 3D printing and specifically of uh, composite materials like such as the ABS carbon fiber. Uh, to give you a little bit of background on uh, end of arm tooling, so it's a very uh, important aspect of robotics and automation. Essentially, we're talking about the part that goes uh, on the end of the robot arm. And the, these robot arms are used, like I said, for automation. Uh, so you can automate uh, certain processes that previously were uh, done manually. To give you two examples, uh, you know, if you have a CNC machine, you need to keep the machine running and you need to make sure that uh, the metal part is placed in the machine. And once uh, the machine is done, it's taken out and a new one is put in. And that's a very manual process. You don't need to have a person do that, you can have the robot arm do that. And, uh, you know, actually all access robotics was able to, uh, by that, uh, train their employees to, to perform other tasks that really need them and be much more uh, efficient in their operation. So some of the challenges with uh, end of arm tooling are that, you know, these robot arms can only hold a certain weight. So you want your tool that goes uh, on the end of the robot arm to be as lightweight as possible because if it's very heavy, made out of a heavy metal, uh, then uh, you reduce the load that it can actually lift. Um, these 
end effectors are also usually designed for very specific tasks. So, and, and those tasks change, right? Like if you have a machine shop or if you have a production line and uh, you have a new part coming in that needs to be made, uh, maybe your gripper that is at the end of the robot arm needs to change. So custom parts, again, is very good for 3D printing because 3D printing really shines where you need to uh, uh, manufacture a small quantity of parts that are very specialized. Um, and then uh, oftentimes these end effectors are also fairly complex. Uh, as you can see here, it needs to fit onto the robot arm and then there's usually other parts that go onto it. Uh, so when you use traditional manufacturing, it can take a very long time to make these parts and can be very expensive. So in terms of the benefits of 3D printing, you know, you can print very organic, very uh, uh, complex parts, and that also oftentimes also helps with the light weighing. So in addition to the material, you can also change, uh, you have pretty much freedom in terms of how you design, design the part. Uh, you have a lower cost, usually faster turnaround time, uh, and you can not only use the 3D printer for the final part that goes onto the robot arm, but you can also iterate very quickly and prototype and turn around functional prototypes, test it, uh, change it, and then print it out again. So it's really the design cycle, I think, that is also very important here. And lastly, like uh, Ryan mentioned, the uh, weight to strength ratio of these composite materials is very good, meaning that they have very good strength for how light they are. Uh, and that's that's really important for this application. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit specifically about this part that I'm highlighting here. Essentially, it's a dual gripper. So uh, usually you can only have one gripper that you put onto a robot arm. And the goal of that gripper is to pick up a, it's a uh, pick and place operation. So it, it picks up a part and puts it into the CNC machine. And then once it's done, it takes it out. Uh, All Access Robotics had the challenge that this robot arm had to handle two different parts. So they wanted to have two different grippers that go on to the same robot arm so that when they switch back and forth, they didn't have to change uh, the, the tool. Uh, it can automatically switch and it can be programmed in a way that it switches between the two different grippers. Uh, so they 3D printed this adapter that you see here in the middle. Uh, and yeah, I wanted to highlight a couple of aspects that are important with uh, this adapter, this dual gripper. First of all, you need the dimensional accuracy. So with method, you get actually a guaranteed printed part dimensional accuracy of plus minus 0.2 millimeters. And that's important because the gripper has to fit onto the robot arm. So if your print is not precise, it may not fit onto it. That's even more important when you have uh, even more complex assemblies, which often is the case uh, for robot arms. Then the part is printed with the ABS carbon, so that gives it the strength and the uh, low weight. And it was also printed with Stratasys SR30 uh, support material. That is a material that is very unique that Stratasys developed. It is uh, soluble, like I said, but also uh, bonds very, very well with ABS. It's uh, really the best support material out there specifically for ABS, uh, providing you a very good surface finish and allowing you to print very complex parts. So next, I wanted to highlight one more application uh, in the end of arm tooling category. This is uh, the part, the white part that you see here is a dual sander. So essentially this uh, tool uh, sands down a metal part that you see down here that comes out of the CNC machine. And that would have done previously uh, with, uh, it, it would be a manual operation. So you have actually have someone standing there sanding down uh, this part. So with the sanding uh, tool, they were able to completely automate that operation. And it's not just, uh, it's actually a dual sander. So you can see each side has a different grid of sandpaper. So they can start with a rougher one and then go to the finer paper. Uh, this part specifically was really good uh, for 3D printing because it is extremely complex. You can see the vacuum going into the part. That one is actually uh, vacuum out the dust as it sands the part. So the part has lots of internal channels and those channels uh, really require the soluble support that we have. And if you were to machine this part, it would be a very, very complex assembly. So 
meaning that you have to break down the part into many different uh, individual parts and then assemble it. So that takes a very, very long time to produce and it's very expensive. So again, a very good example for how you can use a 3D printer for this uh, very specific application. So for the sander that I just showed, I also wanted to show the cost saving. This is actually something that All Access Robotic, uh, Robotics provided us. Uh, it compares in-house CNC uh, to 3D printing. So if you were to make this part out of aluminum, uh, you can see, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is quite expensive. It's $3,600. The same part 3D printed on the method is only $115. Uh, this includes the material cost and also the uh, labor cost. So this is, I think, the really crucial part here. The total labor time for the CNC part is 24 hours for the 3D printer is really 10 minutes. So uh, very, very fast. If you compare the print time, obviously uh, this is an extremely com complex part. That's why it's uh, pretty long. But uh, yeah, the main benefit of 3D printing this part really is in the cost savings and also uh, uh, in the fact that the machine shop doesn't have to use the CNC machine. They can, because if they have to use the CNC machine for uh, producing a part like this, essentially they have to interrupt their production. They have to take a machine that usually produces customer parts and uh, use it for internal production. And that's that's a big interruption. And it's using a very expensive machine for something that you can do easily on a 3D printer so that you don't have to interrupt your operation. So that's, that's a little bit on the ROI uh, of using a 3D printer for uh, this type of tooling application. Uh, next, I want to talk about selecting a 3D printer for ABS composites. So there are many different aspects of this uh, that I'm gonna step through. First of all, heated build plate versus heated chamber. Uh, that goes into the second point here, the layer adhesion and part strength. Uh, those, those architectural designs have a very big impact on the strength of the part and also the dimensional accuracy, which is the next part. Then I'm gonna talk about the different support options that you have for your part and uh, do an introduction to the uh, MakerBot method 3D printer that I mentioned in the beginning. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the Kimia and MakerBot partnership and where we are and what the, some of the next steps are in terms of the materials uh, that work on the method. So very quickly in terms of the difference between a heated build plate and a heated chamber, uh, most of you, if you have looked at desktop 3D printers, you have probably looked at a printer that has a heated build plate. It's the most common design uh, because it is uh, much easier to make. Uh, basically, these printers go all the way back to the WrapRap project um, and have you know evolved significantly since then. But the downside of a heated build plate is that you're only controlling really the heat of the first layer. So that's very good for uh, build plate adhesion. But as the build plate moves down and you're moving up in the part, uh, essentially you have zero control over the temperature where the extruder is printing. And that is bad, especially for a thermoplastic like ABS because the plastic uh, wants to contract and wants to crack and deform. And if you don't control the temperature, that will speed up that process. So what the heated chamber does is it constantly blows hot air at a certain, certain temperature where the layer is printed. So you have very good control over how, at what temperature uh, or what temperature the layer will have when the next layer is put on top of it. So that really improves the layer adhesion, but also the material will cool down much slower and that will avoid some of the cracking and the delamination that you see uh, with the heated build plate. So here you can see an example of that. On the left side, this part was printed with ABS on a, a desktop 3D printer. The part on the right was printed on the heated chamber. So there's a pretty big difference. Obviously with the heated build plate, it depends on the environment. You know, there are ways to control it a little bit more. There are ways to kind of add uh, maybe housing around it uh, to make sure it's not in a room that is super cold. But at the end of the day, we're talking about professional applications here. We're talking about industrial applications. One of the most important things uh, in that is that you have repeat repeatability so that you know when you produce a part, it's always going to look the same every time. 
And if you have a heated build plate, as I mentioned, the environmental factors can really influence your results. And uh, that is something that really will hold you back in terms of uh, being able to produce the same part quality over and over. So next I wanna talk about the dimensional accuracy of the printed part. This is something that for engineers is very important because at the end of the day, you design your part in the CAD program and you want to make sure that the part that comes out of the printer uh, resembles the dimensions as closely as possible. So there's a lot of confusion, I think, that we have seen in the marketplace around uh, part accuracy. So a lot of printers uh, advertise the layer resolution, which obviously is an important part, uh, it, but it only describes uh, to what degree the build plate moves down as the layer is put down so that uh, you have a certain height of the layer. And that can be important if you have uh, a rounded surface, for example. Uh, if you have a higher layer resolution, you will see less of the steps. So, but it doesn't really indicate at all to what degree your printed part resembles uh, your CAD file. Because as I mentioned, you can have a very high layer resolution and print uh, ABS on a heated build plate, and then you get all this deformation and cracking, so your dimensions are gonna be completely off. And if you are printing a tool for a robot arm, as I described in the previous uh, example, and it, it may not fit onto your part, or it may not be as strong as you want it to be, then that is a big problem, and it will throw you back. Uh, then you also have the XYZ positioning precisions, precision that is spec'd out for a lot of printers. That one really just talks about the stepper motor accuracy, which again, you know, it can improve your performance, but it also doesn't speak to the uh, dimensional accuracy of the part. And then lastly, this is something that we use for our method. It's the printed part dimensional accuracy. So we actually measure the parts. We have uh, many, many printers that are running. Uh, for thousands of hours uh, printing parts, and we have a high precision measuring machine to measure the parts and compare it against the dimensions of the CAT model and make sure that it is within a very tight tolerance, which is 0.2 millimeters uh, for the printed part. And that's actually what you want to look for if you select a printer for, the, uh, for these kind of industrial applications. You want to make sure that the manufacturer uh, guarantees a certain printed part dimensional accuracy. So then I wanna quickly go into supports. Uh, you have essentially two different options. So to give you a little bit of background, if you print a part, if you have an angle that's usually greater than 45 degrees, uh, if you print that without any supports, what will happen is that your layer will just droop down and it will not be supported. So you need to print some something underneath, which you can see here in the left picture, this really big angle here. If you didn't print un anything under here, you were just printing in the air. So there are two different ways to do that. You can either print a breakaway support like you see in the left uh, picture here that you can just break away, which is great. It uh, prints very fast, but uh, a downside is that you will have some residue underneath the part. It will be a, not a very clean surface in most instances. Uh, and also you're limited with your geometries because if you have areas inside the print that you can't reach, you obviously can't uh, remove that support. On the right side, we are showing soluble support, and this is the SR30 soluble support I mentioned from Stratasys. Uh, this support prints the white part here, basically wherever the support is needed. It can also print inside the part. Then the part is being taken uh, into a wash tank with a solution, and it washes away. Then when you take it out, you will have a very, very clean surface finish. And as I mentioned, you can print really a complex part like this that has these internal cavities. Um, SR30 essentially has very similar ingredients uh, as ABS, and that's why it bonds so well. It's essentially like you're printing ABS on top of ABS, and that's why you're getting this really clean surface finish that you can't get from other uh, support materials. So next, I wanna do a very quick intro to the Method X. This is the latest printer in our Method uh, lineup. So we, that we essentially have two printers. We have the Method and the Method X right now. And then we just recently also launched carbon fiber additions that come, come actually with a uh, composite extruder. But this extruder is also available for both of the Method and the Method X as an upgrade. So each of these uh, printers can print composite materials. The difference between the Method and the Method X is that uh, the Method X has a higher chamber temperature 
uh, it goes up to 110 C. And that's actually what, uh, well, not 110 C, but 100 C is needed for ABS. Uh, you can also print even uh, materials with a higher heat resistance like PC ABS. And uh, that's when you need 110 C. So these are two, uh, all the method printers are uh, professional 3D printers. And I want to quickly go over what differentiates them from uh, other printers on the market. So on the left side, you see the desktop 3D printers. They're usually pretty accessible. But as I mentioned, because they have a heated build plate, uh, they can be a little bit more unpredictable in terms of the precision and reliability because they're not really controlling the printing environment as well as the industrial 3D printers. Those usually have a heated build plate. Uh, so they, have, uh, they give you guaranteed printed part accuracy. They're very reliable. But unfortunately, they're not as accessible. So both in terms of price point and operation, uh, usually they're out of, the, out of range for a lot of people. So method really falls uh, in between these two, combining the accessibility, uh, also the openness of a desktop 3D printer with the precision and reliability of an industrial 3D printer. So when you look at the different things that make method uh, a good 3D printer, you have a heated chamber. I talked about the benefits of that in terms of the dimensional accuracy and part strength. You also have an open platform for advanced engineering materials. So you can print materials like the Kimia materials. Uh, if you have our MakerBot Labs extruder, that, uh, which I will cover in one of the next slides. And then we also give you the guaranteed part accuracy and the SR30 soluble support. Uh, so both of those go towards making parts that are more accurate. Uh, and then lastly, we you can save time uh, with a very automated workflow. And we also have a couple of CAD integrations that uh, further speed up your whole 3D printing process. Again, as I mentioned, the heated chamber really is the biggest differentiator. We have other features on this printer that uh, make it uh, more like, or that uh, come down from the industrial 3D printer. We actually developed the printer together with Stratasys uh, for over three years. So it has also a very stiff frame, which gives you very good layer alignment. But the heated chamber really is the feature that stands out. So you can, again, control the temperature of every layer. Uh, and you have the dimensional accuracy. And you have superior layer bonding. Uh, next, I want to talk also within method about uh, MakerBot Labs. So MakerBot Labs is a program that we launched end of last year and it turns the method 3D printers into an open materials platform. So we sell a separate extruder that you can see here, the one with the yellow badge, that uh, allows you to print third-party materials. Uh, and we partner with companies like Kimia to qualify the materials. So we don't, you, obviously you're not restricted. You can print any material, but we want to provide a, 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 an experience that is as good as it gets. So we have a, uh, a process of qualifying a material for the printer that goes through uh, a, a sequence of prints to make sure that the uh, material meets the criteria that we're looking for. Uh, and then we publish those print settings and you can find them online and uh, print with the material. So really all you need is that extruder. It also has some benefits. Uh, other benefits, the extruder is very uh, serviceable so you can very easily replace the nozzle. Uh, so if you run into any issues, uh, there's a lot of self-maintenance that you can do with this extruder. I want to give a very quick preview. This is something that uh, we really haven't talked about too much. But if uh, you look up MakerBot and the method and look at the recent news, we just recently announced a composite extruder that is optimized for composite materials. So there's a couple of changes uh, to uh, highlight those. With the current labs extruder that we sell, you can also print these composite materials. It already has a hardened steel nozzle that you can see here uh, that can withstand the you know, more abrasive nature of the carbon fiber, for example, really well. Um, but we recently made some upgrades. So we changed uh, the drive gears that are inside the extruder and uh, made them out of a harder metal material. And, and we also replaced the filament switch uh, which previously was made out of plastic, and then now uh, it is made out of metal. So all of this will give you an extended lifetime. So with the standard labs extruder, you can print these composite materials, but with these upgrades, uh, you will get an even longer lifetime. And uh, 
this updated version, which we call Gen 2, will probably be available uh, in the next four to eight weeks. So lastly, I want to quickly talk about where we are with Kimia. We're obviously very excited to partner with Kimia uh, to bring all of these new materials that Ryan discussed uh, onto the Method platform. Uh, we've been working very closely with them. And so far, uh, the ABS carbon and the Petri carbon, uh, the two materials that are already qualified for Method. So today, if you buy a Method and if you get the Labs Extruder, these are two materials that you can buy and very easily print already. Uh, and currently, we're in the process of also qualifying the ABS Kevlar, the ABS ESD, and the conductive ABS. So those are some materials that uh, are coming up pretty soon. But you know, as I mentioned, we we go through like a pretty uh, extensive process to make sure that these materials print well and that we are able to provide uh, you guys the right settings for it. Ryan. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So, as uh, Johan mentioned, we are working very closely together. What's great about this uh, partnership program is that we do work together. Where uh, Kimia will work on the application studies as well as MakerBot, and so with that, it's a way to make sure that we marry the two and we make sure we have a good performance in there. So, as Johan mentioned, ABS Kevlar will be the next one to be qualified and then followed with uh, ABS, ESD, and finally electrically conductive in the middle of summer. So those materials are available, but right now we're working on all the final settings to ensure that we have all the print profiles ready to go and to help you then user with these. So yeah, it's really I, exciting. We, we can go, uh, we'll go into the questions and answers, but I, I just, uh, I followed some of the discussion here in the chat and I saw a lot of questions of, around ABS and why ABS. Uh, and hey, you know, why aren't you guys using PEG? So I, I guess I wanted to offer two answers to that. And Ryan, you can also jump in. But you know, the ABS is uh, is one of the most commonly used uh, plastics out there. It's used for injection molding in many applications. Uh, and the reason really is the combination of properties. So yes, with PEG you get fairly close to it. But if you look, for example, at the glass transition temp temperature and the uh, heat resistance of the material abs certainly is, is higher than PEG, and i think that's that's one of the key advantages and you can even see that uh by the fact that PEG you can print on the magnet which uh, chamber temperature that goes up to 60 c for abs you need the method x which goes up to 100 c because you need higher chamber temperature uh, so that that's that's one uh, and the other thing I wanted to highlight is obviously we do have a patchy carbon that's qualified and Kimia has a lot of other types of materials, um, uh, which may be in another webinar at some point we can discuss. But the other benefit of ABS versus other materials such as nylon, for example, which is also a very uh, popular composite, is that it is not moisture sensitive. So it's very easy to handle. If you leave, leave the spool out, if the if it's exposed to moisture, you don't run into the same issues that you run uh, into with a lot of other materials. So, so those are some of the, the advantages. Obviously, always depends on the application, uh, what exact material you, you choose. But it's a very good base material, I think, in terms of the uh, properties that it has. OK, um, we have a few minutes. Uh, to wrap this up and we're going to answer a few questions so you already well thank you first of all ryan and you had for the presentation i think it was very informative um i'm just gonna quickly jump to a few questions i saw so there was one about abs which you just answered and then um one was focusing actually on carbon fiber plastic filaments and uh Someone asked if you could comment on the use of uh, these carbon fiber and plastic filaments for the use in structural aircraft components, and mm -hmm. also asking if uh, Kimia is working with Peak. So um, yeah, no, I, I saw that question come up. So Kimia, we do have a full range of materials. I, I presented it earlier in one of the slides, and so we have materials that are aerospace grade. Uh, and the one thing you'll see with the range that we have and what we're working with is trying to find the, the holes in the 
in the offerings because again, it's about uh, providing those solutions. And so we are not working with a uh, peak, but we do have PEC. And then within the PEC, we have the PEC A and the PEC carbon fiber. So if you need the higher temperature resistance, higher chemical resistance, you have the, the PEC. And PEC is actually easier to, to work with than PEAK in, in 3D printing standpoint. So there's a lot of benefits there. Um, within the Kimya range, we also have PEI, but then you're going into a, a high temperature thermoplastics. And so you're, you're jumping up to the next layer of, uh, of printing, uh, which are also aerospace standpoint. But yeah, if you go back into what uh, Johan was bringing up and you, you, saw, you saw that we partner already on our, our PET G carbon fiber, we have a full range of materials. And again, the key is to find which material is the best for your application. And then that's what's really great about 3D printing is that you don't have to be making millions of pieces at a time. So you can really optimize every, every component for your design. And can you actually customize also the, I mean, I don't know if. I'm sorry, you Carlota, did, did, did you freeze on me? Johan, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but uh, I think okay. what a... Yeah, well, I see a question on the bottom here, um, yeah. and this was more towards uh, uh, to you, Johan, but um, between Peak yeah. and PEC, are they printable on the MakerBot? So do you want to... So, current, yeah, currently we can't print them on the method, but it's certainly something that we're looking at. Uh, one thing I can say, if you look back, uh, you know, at the speed at which we have added materials, it's pretty incredible. Uh, we, when we first launched Method, we had three materials uh, last year, and now we're up to 17. So <laughs> I can tell you that uh, we're definitely looking at additional materials, um, and, the, and especially materials that have a little bit of higher heat resistance and that can work in our chamber. Uh, in terms of also the support material, I see a question here. Uh, we do have SR30 and we also have PVA, which obviously uh, works more for the uh, lower temp materials. So PLA, TAF, PETG, nylon. Uh, we do not have the SR110 for PC yet, but we do have a, a PC material in our uh, labs program, which works with the uh, SR30. So uh, that's something that is currently available. And obviously, both on the model and the support material uh, front, we're looking at additional materials as well. OK, um, I think we're going to wrap it up now. Um, thank you for taking over, as I had some technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, thank you uh, to both Ryan and Johan. Um, just so that everyone uh, is aware, you will be able to find this uh, webinar, a replay of this webinar on our YouTube channel and on 3D Natives. Uh, and if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to contact us and we will put you in contact with the correct person. So I don't know if you have any last words um, before we finish. Johan, Ryan. Well, I just would like to thank everybody for attending. You know, it's a really exciting time in uh, additive manufacturing. It's it's fun to come up with uh, new materials and partner with somebody like MakerBot that can really take those materials and make them work. And so that's the key for us. So it's a it's a really exciting time. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to echo that. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, participating, and I, I'd be happy to answer any follow up questions uh, if they can be directed to me. And yeah, we're excited to continue to work with uh, Kimia and uh, add more materials to the Method platform. So uh, definitely stay tuned for more to come. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone, bye-bye. Thank right, you. Bye -bye.